okay. Wasn't Danielle great? That was she was great. She was so game. That was awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Danielle. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, man, that episode of Summer House tonight, uh, really, really painful to watch the Lindsay and Carl stuff, but also uh, very tension filled with Kyle and Amanda. Uh, so I think we've got a really, by the way, I was about to say, we've got a really decent, uh, decent season of Summer House. And I just thought how tragic and potentially pathetic that I'm like uh, a lot of personal turmoil going to be really entertaining. That's dark stuff, folks. And moving on to even darker stuff, we've got the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills reunion for season 13, part one of three. And uh, listen, there were some really good moments in this. Uh, but like I said, if you compare it to the Miami reunion where they were just like, da, 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 just like, Bleh! it was just it, the energies were completely different. And I think that's good that we have all different iterations of the housewives. Everything can coexist. But this reunion all kind of boils down to a couple main issues. And one of those, of obviously, is Kyle Richards. Kyle Richards. Um, Kyle Richards has tried to protect Whatever is going on in her real life, and we do know a lot of those things, obviously, with the, the death of her friend, the um, separation between her and Mauricio, whatever is going on with Morgan Wade, I'm Morgan, she stalked me, whatever's going on there. But the season is interesting only if you kind of read between the lines, if you kind of think, wow, Kyle really is trying to protect a lot of personal information. And I don't necessarily just mean her and Morgan, but you know, you do, she, she's trying to protect her daughters, but at the same breath, she's also putting her daughters on screen, making them do scenes where her family talks about separating. That's a really hard thing to ask of children. And I think, uh, Kyle probably is not in her right mind in, um, I mean, who is these days, but in certain aspects of this and maybe did not think it all the way through. And I will say the same thing of Mauricio, because we know all the daughters on, are on buying Beverly Hills season two. That's that's a tough place to put your children um, to all of a sudden go, hey, take over the family business. And uh, no, I don't mean uh, being realtors. I mean, being on reality TV. That's a really tall order to ask. But it's also something that I've been saying to you guys for so long is that, you know, these shows, which are projected to be about friendships, about the, the strength of women friendship, is that these are working relationships. I mean, some of these relationships are very real, and I think they do hang out. Uh, I do know a couple, like, you know, I, I know Crystal and Sutton and Garcelle. I know they actually do hang out, but then there's a core group of them, like Dorit, Erica, Kyle. We find out in the beginning, like, that these are, like, Kyle doesn't consider these real relationships. It's not a part of her day-to-day -day life. These are working relationships. And I do agree with Kyle that it doesn't mean that she doesn't like Dorit and doesn't love Dorit, but it's not a part of their day-to-day. -day. And I think that's sometimes the fallacy we get in our heads about these of like, this is their reality. It's like, dude, that's why I always laugh about Tom Schwartz and him talking about the gang of Vanderpump Rules. There's no more gang of Vanderpump Rules. These people aren't in each other's daily lives. And I do like when that, curtain is pulled back and go, yeah, the, the, you know, we don't go out to lunch that often, Dorit. And then you have people like Dorit that wants to actually probably be in Kyle's daily life. And at this point, it's not possible. Now, like I always say, there's seasons for friendship and I'm sure Dorit and Kyle will be fine in the long run. I mean, Erica Jane at this point, she's showing up to collect a paycheck and to not be yelled at like she's been in other seasons. And I don't, to not, I love that she thought Andy like really held her feet to the fire. And I remember watching those episodes of seasons past with Erica going, go further, Andy, you need to go harder. So it is interesting when People like Erica Jane then have grudges coming into a reunion thinking that they were treated unfairly. And like I said, it's like this gigantic game of hot potato. And who's got the hot potato this season? And it's Kyle Richards. And she spent the whole season trying to throw the potato to other people because she didn't want to hold it. She wasn't comfortable with the heat. And it kind of made a little bit of mess. And that's where we are right now is not Kyle necessarily cleaning up a mess, but having to explain certain inconsistencies and why we didn't see certain aspects of a story. So you get to the reunion and it's interesting because you got all of these ladies thinking completely different things. And sometimes it's very unsatisfying. 
you know, for an audience because you're like, ah, oh, just give me the real stuff. I don't want to have to go digging for it. I don't want to have to watch a season of buying Beverly Hills on Netflix. I say, I actually do want to watch nine. Beverly. You, you know what I'm saying? It shouldn't be another thing added to our plate. My home team, like I said, is Bravo network. I want my home team to get the dirt. I don't want to go over to Netflix and go, why did they get a better storyline out of Mauricio than we got out of Kyle on Bravo TV? And she's been there 13 years. She's very comfortable. And another thing, I'm going to throw it right here. This is a so bad it's good prediction, folks. You heard it here first. I have no information that this would happen. But did you notice how they had two different segments with Miss Freddie Mellencamp? You know what I'm saying? Miss Freddie Mellencamp had two separate uh, segments in the reunion part one. I think there is a world in which to entice Kyle to come back to this show, not saying that she was saying that she's leaving, but to make, to sweeten the pot. What if we brought back your friend, Freddie Mellencamp? What if we brought back one of your actual close friends to Real Housewives of Beverly Hills? I tell you, I think they're, they're greasing the wheels there. I think, I really do. There's a world in which I could see that happen. So Kyle feels very comfortable. And I think Freddie's over there going, okay, I've studied it all on my podcast. I think I can actually give some good TV this time. Uh, my dad's still John Mellencamp. I got that in my back pocket. I know Tamara. Let's see where we go with this. Don't say I'm crazy, folks. I think there's a world in which that could possibly happen. But let's go through the script. Let's go through the text of last night's episode. When I was studying Shakespeare, you would always have to go to the work itself. You would always have to break it down beat by beat, iambic pentameter. Let's see what Shakespeare is trying to tell us. Now, of course, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills is not Shakespeare, but it's it's pretty damn close. So we're going to go through, like we always do, this script, try to find the places that are ridiculous and make us laugh, and maybe try to find the places where we agree and uh, see what each one of these ladies are doing. A special thanks, as always, to Juliana Carrazzo, who takes the most amazing notes. Uh, I'm very sad. We're, we're two episodes away from it being done for the season, and I know we're both very excited about that, but she is just the best. So thank you, Juliana, as you're listening. She is just amazing. So season 13, episode 18, reunion part one. This is the summary that the cable company gives us in the midst of of headlines and hurt feelings. Ooh, that's a dynamic phrase. Uh, the diamonds of Beverly Hills, California come face to face for a tense reunion. <laughs> I like when they make it seem like it's a war, like it's like ninjas or something like that. Uh, the diamonds of Beverly Hills, California come face. Now I just, I'm picturing Alan Cumming hosting all of these, like the diamonds of Beverly Hills, California come face to face for a tense reunion. Of traitors of Beverly Hills. We have the preview for the reunion, which we are going to skip over, but Andy reminds us tonight, the three part Beverly reunion, Beverly Hills reunion begins. And we see everything that we're going to potentially see over these next three episodes. Then we enter with reunion day part one. Let me paint the picture for you folks. It's still dark and the women are arriving for glam to Culver City studio lot in beautiful Culver City. Erica Jane is first at 6.16 a.m., looking fresh as a daisy, probably uh, coming off a night of doing the hippity-dippity with many random gentlemen, because with there's one thing we know about Erica is, I like dick, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the hop and dance in the chance do the hop, Erica Jane's back. So she's walking to her trailer noticing the names on each one of the trailers. And she's like, oh, look at these interesting placements. And they show Sutton's name and she walks by and she goes, if you put me next to Sutton, I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> you would be lucky to be put next to Sutton Strack. How dare you, Erica Jane? How dare you? This is the kind of, don't get too cocky, Erica. I'm telling you, we have the, you know, listen, things have a way of coming back around, as you know. In fact, Erica Jane is in a bit of legal trouble more this week, which we'll probably talk about later. So Kyle arrives at 6.37 a.m. A, uh, she comes on horseback from a mysterious country singer dropping her off. Uh, here it is, Culver City Studios, Kyle. I'll see you later, special friend. We actually don't. That doesn't happen. Dorit arrives 6.51 a.m. Garcelle pulls in at 6.58. And Sutton with her French bulldog at 7.26 a.m. Do you think Sutton's uh, chauffeur that she's made out with a couple of times is the one that dropped her off of like, 
Oh, oh, Randy, I say, I say, you can drop me off right here. I'll see you later, Randy. Now, a producer to Sutton, when she arrives, goes, how are you feeling about today? And Sutton's like, well, you you know what it is. You know, it's closure. <laughs> That's what this is, I say, I say. And then we're in Kyle's trailer, and she is holding gigantic crystals. You know, you, you know when things are going well when you're traveling with crystals, you know? Um, Kyle's like, they're supposed to help with anxiety and stress. And then we go to Garcelle's trailer and she's in a robe burning sage. I mean, literally, this is like fucking witchcraft in Culver City. And she's like, positive energy, everybody living in their truth, speaking their truth. And then we're over in Sutton's trailer with Avi, her house manager, giving her a pep talk. And, 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 you know, he's like, no crying today. No crying. Sutton, Sutton. And Sutton is just wearing eye patches. And she's like, strong with Sutton. No crying today. Santos, Santos, hut, hut, ha. I say, I say. But this is the insane. I was on um, your Bish therapist, uh, your Bish therapist podcast today. It's going to come out on Tuesday. And we had a fantastic conversation about Beverly Hills and and all of like so many great things. I hope you'll tune in on Tuesday with her podcast. She's great. But it is also interesting with the no crying today, you know, is Melissa and I both agree on I want to see emotions. And it is interesting that these ladies feel like they can't cry, that they got to be strong around each other. They got to prove something. And I'm the opposite. I want people, I want, I want to see it all. If you feel like crying, you cry, Sutton. Cry me a river. And I mean that in a good way. And then Andy arrives to the lot carrying the suit he's going to wear. Uh, And and by the way, I look very closely, no cocaine anywhere on him. Uh, This guy is sharp and ready to go. I noticed he was wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt, but they had to blur it out. And I was like, why can't they have a Grateful Dead t-shirt on Bravo? And he was, he's like, big day, Beverly Hills, she, 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 like Kevin Lee. And Kyle's instructing her makeup artist what eye powder to wear when there's a knock on the trailer door. And Andy goes, hey, OJ, OG. And Kyle's like, oh, how you doing? Right now, I'm okay. And then Andy goes, okay, Mo's going to be joining us today. And Kyle's like, you're fucking lying. And he goes, no, I am lying. I'm sorry. And he goes, you fucker, Andy, you, oh my God, oh my God. And it's very funny. I love that Kyle really did think this was a possibility. And then when we realized it's not a possibility, I was like, but why can't it be a possibility? It would make amazing television. And I will say this, listen, you know, Andy, and we'll talk about on the second part of this episode of what Andy's duties are over at Bravo, but Kyle is very comfortable if we're calling him the boss. Kyle's very comfortable calling Andy, you fucker, you know? And there is this kind of bantering relationship. No, I do not think it should go into snorting big lines of coke anywhere, but there is this playfulness, and that's what we've always liked to see. At least I've always liked to see. Um and then a song plays as we usually do in these things. Gotta dance, gotta live, gotta wonder, gotta learn how to keep going under, gotta keep living life. And we the circle of glam continues. And Anna Marie in the trailer, she's like, I can honestly say this was the hardest year of my life. And then in Dorit's trailer, we have Erica. And Erica's like, Dorit, hi, sweetheart. Can I come in? Yes, my love. Beep, boop, 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 boop. What's going on? Well, you know, listen, I'm just getting used to the situation. And Erica's like, are you nervous about today? And Dorit's like, you know, there's stuff with Kyle and I that's going on, and it hurts and bothers me the most. And you obviously saw in the press one of the things where she said that I exaggerated our friendship. And we flash back to a video of Kyle on Amazon Live. Listen, this Amazon Live, we have too many Bravo celebrities doing Amazon Live. I'm like, is Amazon like an affiliate of Bravo at some point? Like, why am I always seeing fucking Lala selling shower goods and like putting dirt on an ant, like putting actual like sh- good information on an Amazon Live? Like, I'm so confused. And Kyle's like, on the Amazon Live, we see Kyle going, we've only gone on one trip together, Dorit, you know, and there's a couple that I can rec- recall, uh, Mo, PK, Dorit, and me. It's not like, you know, my friends, where we'll go out to the gym together, we'll work out together, we'll hike together, and she doesn't do that kind of stuff. So, you know, it was just, it was just to put it bluntly, an exaggeration, completely. So Dorit saw this Amazon Live. And, you know, Dorit's an Amazon Prime member, so I'm sure this really hurts. But Dorit tells Erica, I haven't heard from her in a couple months. 
And then she sends me a text yesterday, Erica, basically trying to silence me. It was so manipulative. It was so calculated. And Dorit opens her phone and hands it to Erica to read. And Erica's like, it's like a novel. Uh. <laughs> like Erica's like, I'm waiting for the movie. Jesus. And Dorit's like, thank you. You see. And she's like, what the fuck? And she starts reading it. Hi, I've been wa wanting to reach out because I know we're in a weird place and it really bothers me. Of course, some interview comments hurt my feelings and created more issues for me. And I don't want to lose someone else in my life over a TV show. They don't even know we're going through a hard time. So I don't see the need in bringing it up here. I would like to sit down and talk after we get through tomorrow. And Dreet's like, how would you feel if you got this message? And Erica's like, I would feel manipulated. And Dorit's like, okay, you said on Watch What Happens Live, Erica, I got eviscerated. I love Kyle, but fair is fair. Yeah, I did say that. Okay, this is exactly my point. Fair is fair. This is the reunion. Dorit seeing stars in her eyes, thinking, oh my God, I finally got a storyline. I think it was supposed to be fashion for me this year, according to my tagline, but that didn't work out. So now I got a little meat on the bone. What do, how, When do I play this ace card? And Erica's like, I hear you, Dorit. I understand exactly where you're coming from, and I hate every moment of this. And let me look at the subtext of what Erica's saying. Um... I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I fucking love every moment of this. The heat isn't on air. Good Yeah. Okay, so the women are ready. They're entering the studio and being directed to the seating area. And Sutton is outside the stu studio getting last minute touch-ups. And she's like, I brought my big brush. I got a big old brush. I brought my Santos brush for me and my, for my extensions if you need it. And Eric is ready. She looks over and walks by her. Anna Marie gets directed onto the set. Garcelle comes out to join Sutton and they're led into the studio where it's still dark. And Sutton's like, well, I can't see. I, I can't feel my feet. Oh, golly, oh, gee. And we know Sutton seems to have balancing issues. So it's just like, I mean, we've seen her fall quite a bit. So I was like, you can't feel your feet. Also, don't say that around Anna Marie. She's going to think it's an esophageal issue. And Garcelle goes, it's so dark. It is. And then Andy is sitting in the hosting chair, studying his notes slash phone. And he's like, the dynamic duo is here. And Garcelle's like, this is gorgeous. The set, by the way, it is. And they have one of those big, gigantic video screens that they had for the Real Housewives of Orange County reunion. And it just made me laugh just thinking, Truly, how did we get that fucking Cracker Barrel Dave and Buster's set for Real Housewives of Salt Lake City? <laughs> like they couldn't, they they didn't have the big, beautiful video screen. So they made it look like a high school production of the Pirates of Penzance. It was great. Anyways, Erica and Anna Marie enter and Andy's like, the showgirls are here. And Erica's like, come on, slit. And I thought, I thought she was saying slut, but I guess Anna Marie has a slit in her dress. But I just, because very Erica to be like, come on, slut. Yeah, like Erica. Yeah. I'm being obnoxious already. <laughs> it's, it's almost the weekend. Anyways, the lights are suddenly turned on and the women gasp. And we finally see the video screen. And they're like, oh. And it's like an outdoor patio with a view of the Hollywood Hills. And we see Tom Girardi's car go uh, over a hit. No, just remember that when he crashed the car and that came out a couple of years ago? Anywho, it would be interesting if we did just see that things like that over the video screen. Uh, like we see Aviva's leg flying in the Hollywood Hills skyline at some point. And Kyle enters the set and she's like, this is beautiful. Is this all us? Uh, did Hey, did is this the money that Vanderpump Rules made? Are we spending it on this video screen? Anyways, we're waiting for Dorit, you guys. And the camera show Dorit is outside her trailer getting sewn up in her dress. And yes, I've seen all of the amazing memes and jokes. She looks like Sutton's esophagus. She looks like Elliot with E.T. She looks like an Imperial Guard from Star Wars. I mean, this truly is a... I mean, what I thought she looked also like is like a slutty version of Mother Teresa. If Mother Teresa was like, 
screw those lepers. Let's go to a gay bar. Like it was like a red kind of mother Teresa. It was like, but then she had like this curly cue in the hair. It was like an, like a Christopher Reeve Superman kind of thing. It was very Dorit, but a producer keeps walking up. It's like how we look in and Dorit Silas is like almost there. It's, it's high. It's like, it's like operating on somebody and the producer's like, okay, almost there inside. Andy sarcastically is like, Oh my God, I'm so glad I got here at eight 15 while we wait for Dorit's dress to be sewed. And son's like, well, I think we should just start. I do. Which, by the way, how entertaining would that be if they did start and Dorit walks in halfway through the reunion? Anyways, Anna Marie finally sees Dorit. She's like, oh, there she is. There's Dorit. Anna Marie, calm. Chill out. Chill out. I know you're looking for allies. Just, it's very exciting. She's in a red dress. She's got a curly cue in her hair. I get it. All exciting. Dorit makes her grand entrance with the bright redded hood dress. And Garcelle mutters, oh, Mother Teresa. And Annie's like, oh, my God. Well, uh, hey, hood, because she has that big red hood on. And Dorit's glam gets her seated, you know, <laughs> sews her into the couch. And Kyle rolls her eyes. Now the producer's like, okay, everybody, quiet, please. Now here is a little bit of dirt. We, you know, so she was late and they said she was late to get to set. But Crystal Minkoff was on Jeff Lewis Live today. And uh, she said that they were waiting for Dorit for dose two hours. They were waiting for her for two hours. They all got there around like 5 36 a.m. And they had to wait two hours for Dorit to be ready. And they were even like, what is going on? And then in classic Dorit fashion, sh they saw her all like posting TikToks and Instagrams in the dress. And I think, you know, we've seen that time and time again with Dorit. And this is one of my frustrating things with Dorit is that everybody tells her the behavior that they don't like. And she says she listens, but she doesn't. She keeps doing the same thing. Like if people say it's really annoying that you're late all the time and then we see you you know, posting to social media instead of coming out when we're all here and she's doing it again, that would annoy the piss out of me. And it kind of truly shows like, what is your deal? Like you say you want to be friends with everybody. I know you want to be here. I think you need to be here. But what are you doing? Wouldn't you make sure you are on time? You are a child of the world, Dorit. What are you doing sometimes? Like to me, that's part of the thing that is so frustrating about Dorit is she can, she's so great, but at the same time, it's maddening that she seems so tone deaf in certain areas when it comes to her own behavior. And I know she means well, but like, why the same thing again and again? And like, if you make fun of somebody for something, usually they're going to course correct. And Dorit is of the, like, no, I'm not course correcting. No, 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 no. Oh, they couldn't have been talking about me. Well, they said Dorit. No, it got to be another Dorit. So anyways, Andy's like, hey, everybody, welcome to the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills season 13 reunion. I'm Andy Cohen, and I still have a job. And tonight, I want to welcome you ladies in a backyard cocktail party in the Hollywood Hills. Hope it's fun. And the ladies are, you know, that awkward laugh of like, oh, this is fun. Let's, you know, I just don't want to be here. And we do the round robin with all the ladies. Andy's like, good evening, Sutton. And Sutton's seen, you know, seated right next to Andy's left. And she's like, well, good evening, Andy. I say, I say, how are you? Well, I'm good. You look beautiful. And she's wearing this cocktail length navy velvet halter dress. Oh, this is funny. I always tell you guys, I just want to remind you. So I was listening to that Jeff Lewis interview with Crystal. And uh, I listen, you know, I'm on that uh, extended version like once a week. So I listen to all the episodes now so I can make sure I'm like, you know, boned up. And I got to tell you. I have kind of like, it is now a part of my day where I actually really enjoy listening to it. And I always, cause I don't really listen to reality show podcasts or stuff. And it's not necessarily a reality show radio show, but it, you know, has enough guests that are, but I've really come to kind of enjoy it. I know that sounds great, but I'm like, I really like it. It's like, it's kind of a nice part of my day. Um, but you know, him and Shane were talking about one of Crystal's talking head looks like, Oh my God, you were in this pink number and it looked great. And I got to tell you, that's where I miss completely. You guys. Like I completely miss fashion. Like I'm not a fashionable person and I don't know women's fashion nor men's fashion. So when there are notes about like what Sutton's wearing, I got to tell you, like, I don't even, you know, I don't even have a visual in my mind. And I've watched this episode three times and I'm like, okay, I just don't see that thing. And I know that's a huge blind spot for me. So I apologize. Anyways, Sutton's like, well, thank you, Andy. I'm just trying to be subtle. And Andy's like, okay, well, do you think you were subtle this season? And she's like, ah, well, uh, yes. Huh. I got my dick riding pants for Magic Mike live. No, and Andy's like, okay, we'll get into that. Hi, Garcelle. 
And she's like, hello, Andy Cohen. And Garcelle's sitting next to Sutton. And Andy's like, how are you? Well, I'm really great. How are you? Well, I'm great. You look beautiful. Thank you so much. And Andy's like, hi, Crystal. And Crystal's like, I'm Crystal. No, she's like, hey, Andy, how are you? And Andy's like, I'm great. How are you feeling tonight? And she feels good. And then Andy goes, good. Anna Marie, welcome to your first reunion. And Anna Marie's sitting on the other side at the very end. And she's like, thank you, Andy. And Andy's like, and let me clarify, it's Anna Marie. And Anne Marie uh, goes, Anna Marie smelled like, spe spelled like Anne Marie. It's a Dutch name. And I'm like, tell me less. <laughs> no, no, I, it is one of those frustrating things when you see it pronounced one way and you hear every, you see it written one way and you hear everybody pronounce it the other way. And I got to tell you, it's frustrated me all season. And I mean, I love the Dutch, but it is one of those things of like, of course, Anna Marie has this with her name. Of course. And Andy's like, hi, Dorit. And Dorit is seated in the middle on Andy's right. And she's like, hi, Andy. And Andy's like, what were you going for today, mysterious lady? Oh, I was going for fashion, fashion, fashion. Uh, and Andy's like, okay. Dorit also told me before the show that she's going to be speaking in bullet points tonight. And Dorit's like, yes, because Dorit is long-winded like I am. And Sutton and Garcelle laugh at this. And Andy's like, Good evening, Erica. How are you? And Erica's sitting seated in the middle. And if you turn your volume up right at this moment, Erica lets out one of the sloppiest farts I've ever. No, <laughs> wouldn't it be good. Like, I'm good. No, she's like, I'm good. It's uh, probably the happiest I've been in this situation in two years. And Andy's like, yeah. Do you share the same feeling tonight, Kyle? And Kyle's sitting directly on Andy's right. So you got Kyle on Andy's right. Sutton's on Andy's left. And Kyle's like, I wish I felt like Erica right now. And Kyle is rubbing a small crystal in her hands. I thought it was a vape at first, but it's a crystal. That's how intense this is. Like she's got crystals with her. And Andy laughs and is like, okay, yeah. Erica mentioned to me on Watch What Happens Live that she was eviscerated a couple of years ago. She felt here and she thinks you're next up for that. And we see a flashback to that Watch What Happens Live where Erica is saying like, I want you to give everybody the same treatment. Now, I do want to put a stop to this right here. Erica's situation was very different. Come on. Like, we, it, it really is apples and oranges. Like, yes, Kyle is going through this upheaval in her personal life. But what Erica was going through by way of her husband, Tom Girardi, was a legal case that really took hold of California. The state bar had to actually do multiple investigations that are not over on it. She is still in legal jeopardy in certain things. Like, I'm sorry, it's very different. And you are being suspected as one of the people involved. So you're damn right it's going to be different questioning. Like, I just don't need Like, I don't. I sometimes don't see where, you know, it's like, no, it is not the same treatment for everybody. Why do we go around acting like that? And I feel like it's almost an excuse for these people to feel like, like some kind of like come up in like, so they can feel good about themselves. When in reality, these aren't the same situations. And also your marriage breaking up, Erica would never be compared to Kyle and Mauricio because at one time they actually were mutually in love with each other. I'm sorry. I said what I said. Anyways, Kyle's on the set and she's like, I saw the next day, the headlines, it went everywhere that, 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 that story. And we see a headline going, Erica Jane wants co-star Kyle Richards eviscerated at reunion. So of course, obviously my feelings got hurt from it, but honestly, you know, Erica has been an amazing friend to me. Kyle, the politician, she's someone that I can trust and someone I value as a friend. And I honestly think she was just trying to say you eviscerated her last year. And it was more about that than about me. And I really did not take that personally. I love that she throws it back on Andy. And at this point, I think Andy's got to be so like kind of put stuff PTSD himself where he's like, oh, fuck, are you going to sue me now? Like, wait, it's me. What? But also, this is like political. This is political, Kyle. This is like Kyle texting Dorit the night before the re reunion. It's like giving Erica Jane a big old sloppy ass kiss before we start this whole production of like, no, Erica's the best friend that I've ever had. I totally respect what she said. Dorit is glaring at Kyle while she's talking, by the way. And Erica's like, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. And I do consider you a very good friend. And I love you. And Annie's like, okay, let's stop lying. Obviously, lots to discuss about you, Mauricio. We're going to get to that later. And Andy's like, Dorit, what the fuck are you wearing for real? No, he's like, what, what, what's your reaction to hearing Kyle's description of her friendship with Erica? And Dorit's like, um, well, uh, I kind of got stuck on the fact that she said when she saw the headlines that it hurt her. 
because it's much the same when I saw the headline. And they show the headline from heavy.com. Kyle Richards says Dorit Kemsley exaggerated their past. And Dorit continues, Kyle said Dorit exaggerated that friendship because that stung. And Kyle interrupts, okay, well, no, I said that in response to all the things that you had been saying throughout the season. Of course, I eventually, once I saw the show, and Dorit interrupts, such as, come on, Kyle, I'm all ears. I can still hear over this big red hood. And Kyle's like, such as, you know, I'm just, first of all, I'm being asked about my marriage on camera and when we are good friends. And this is where Kyle fucks up. It's like, Kyle, man, stop trying to produce the show. Right here is a perfect example of like, she's offended that Dorit asked about her marriage on camera. Like, Kyle, you were on a reality show about your life and I know your marriage isn't going well and that's why you don't want to talk about it, but we got to talk about it. We got to talk about the husband. We do. We have a flashback in the car 10 months earlier and Dorit's like, how are things with you and Moo? And Kyle's like, I feel like I need a little freedom. And Dorit's like, specifically away from your husband? And you can tell Kyle was a little frustrated in that scene. And Kyle's like, and then there was like the, you know, I feel like I was replaced by Morgan comment. We flash back to Andy's Watch What Happens live show one month earlier where Andy is talking to Dorit. How has Kyle's friendship with Morgan Wade affected your friendship with her? Oh, Andy, she'll kill me. But I felt like the closer she got with Morgan, the further she got away from me. Beep, boop, beep, boop, boop, boop. And Andy's like, wow. She stalked me. Dorit's like, I wish Kyle would stalk me like she sucks Morgan. By the way, would it be great if Kyle, uh, you know, whips down the red hood and we see that, or sorry, Dorit whips down the red hood and we see Dorit has like a big Kyle tattoo on her left cheek. How do you like that, Morgan? Look at me. <laughs> I can't sing country, but I've tatted up my body with Kyle tattoos. Anyways, Kyle rattles off. I mean, how many times have we ever had lunch without filming, Dorit? And that actually, to me, is more hurtful than any of this of like, Okay, fine. You want to have this? Like, we're not even friends. Like, tell me how many times we even hang out. Dorit's like, you and I? Over the last seven years in particular? And Kyle interrupts. How have gone many times. I can count on one hand. And Sutton stares into, like, disbelief. I was in disbelief of this. And Dorit's like, Mo and PK are, like, best friends. I also want to push back on that a little bit. I have a feeling Mauricio is one of those type of people that everybody feels like they're his best friend. You know those kind of people? They're kind of magic. And they just make you feel good. And you're like, wow, we got a really strong connection. And then you find out those type of people have that strong of a connection with everybody. Like, I have a feeling like there's people at home that are like, wait a sec, Mauricio's my best friend. I, what? Huh? Even PK's like, he's always been my best friend. Why are we arguing about that? And Andy's like, wow, I got the sense you guys were hanging out a lot outside of the cameras to read. And Kyle's like, that doesn't matter. She's still as important to me. Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't have that kind of friendship. You know, I get up in the morning and I go and I work out. And Dorit's like, but you've never asked me to do that. I've sent you a message saying, Kyle, I'd love to go for a walk. <laughs> imagine, imagine, imagine intense text from Dorit at six in the morning. Kyle, wake up, Kyle. Are you up? Are you walking? Are you, are you at Runyon Canyon, please? Kyle, oh. Uh, I need exercise, please. Uh, huh, I've got spandex on, Kyle, please. I'll bring Gatorade. Let me know where you are. Drop a pin. Share your location with me, please. Please. Are you with Morgan? No, Dorit goes, but you've never asked me to do that. I, and Kyle goes, but actually that's not true, Dorit. By the way, I took you for a walk. And no offense, we know what happened once when I took you to work out. You had to sit down. She sat down on the cement. I like Kyle's subtext. He's like, this is a lazy son of a bitch. Are you kidding me? I'm working out at a very high level and she can't take it. And Kyle's like, she was out of breath, Andy. And Dorit goes, we were in Palm Springs with a group of friends. And uh, they think going for a brisk walk is going 10 miles. Oh, okay. And Andy laughs and Dorit's like, I needed a little preparation. My hammies were tight. Erica in the middle of them trying to get like, it is funny because Erica is like dead in the middle of them. And, you know, she's a little taller, I think, than both of those ladies. So it's very funny because Erica is just so thrilled that it is not the last two seasons for her. So she's just like, you know, she's like a pig in shit. She's having the time of her life. Like, I don't even like, I bet she's like just going over dance moves in her head or thinking about potential costumers she can build for like new clothes, things like that. And Kyle goes, okay, my point is Dorit and I 
I don't want to, I don't want this to get lost. That, that does mean you're not, that doesn't mean you're not very important to me. I love you very much. But when I said that, because that was an exaggeration to take a moment for you to say something at my expense, because you knew that by saying something like that, it was going to create a bigger problem for me in the media with the whole Morgan situation. This is where Kyle, once again, she keeps getting these things wrong. Kyle keeps trying to like throw herself. I don't know. Kyle keeps trying to like pull people on the way down or trying to be like, this is why this situation happened. It's like, Kyle, the Morgan situation, I never heard about from Dorit. I heard it because of your music video with her. I heard it because of all the paparazzi photos. It wasn't because of Dorit. So to equate that Dorit is to blame for certain aspects of this Morgan relationship is equivocally false. Like I spend my life, unfortunately, paying attention to these things. And it's just not, that's the real exaggeration here. Anyways, we have a flashback 10 months earlier to Kyle's celebration of a life event. And she's feeding Morgan fruit off a toothpick. And Kyle's like, here, I don't want this either. And Morgan's like, I'll take it. Feed me fruit, Kyle. And Dorit, you can tell just watching this like, oh, oh I want to be fed strawberries by Kyle. Uh, but anyways, in a talking head, Dorit's like, this is exactly how rumors start. So she, this is the moment she's talking about. But like, I'm sorry, Kyle. I thought way before that moment, oh, like this wasn't the first time of like, wait a sec. Now that I'm taking a second look after that Dorit comment, who is this girl that's all tatted up that Kyle put a K on her body? Wait a, wait a second. I feel like, wait, was she sexy feeding that fruit to Mork? Oh my God, Dorit. Detective Dorit, thank you. Dorit goes, Kyle, the Morgan situation has been in the media was not because of my comment. My point is, Dorit, saying that does not mean you're not important to me. You're very important to me. Look at me. Feel my crystal. I love you very, 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 very much. It's like, don't fucking say another word. Shut up. And Dorit's like, listen, I love to hear it. I do, but I know your nature. If I say something that upsets you, you're a punisher. You'll shut me out. Now, punisher is a very important word because that's what they used to call Lisa Vanderpump back on old seasons of Beverly Hills. Remember that? So that is a fighting word. Dorit does sometimes just pull out a little barb, a little like uh, Beverly Hills history, and she'll kind of use it with reckless abandon. But that, because Erica was like, Zeeks? Erica's like, holy shit, a punisher. Ah. Three continues. We hadn't spoken in a couple of months, and then all of a sudden, you text me the day before the reunion. You know, do you really think that I'm an idiot? Don't answer that. Nobody. Please, nobody answer that. Like you can hear the crew members laughing like, <laughs> I mean, it felt very manipulative. It's not like I'm going to come here and try to destroy you, Kyle. And Kyle's just clenching her jaw, you know, just biting down on a crystal. And she's thinking of the Dorit's next punishment. And Erica, you can tell, like, nipples hard, fully interested now. And Kyle's like, it was not meant to be manipulative in any way. And Sutton looks at Garcelle like, oh, you hearing this bullshit? <laughs> Sandals going to crack up. You know, this is, a, this is hogwash, I say, I say. And Erica takes a deep breath. And like, and Andy's like, well, okay, I know that the two of you love each other. I mean, not like. Kyle and Morgan love each other, but you two love each other. And I think that there's a resolution in your future. And Kyle's pursing her lips. She goes, yeah. yeah. And Dorit's like, I hope so. I certainly hope so. And she looks at Kyle for reassurance and Kyle just presses her lips together harder. And it's like, make me a bird so I can fly far, far away. And Andy goes, we'll be right back. I love when Andy has to like take like, well, moving on. And I love it. It's like, I think there's a lot of hope in your future. I'm like, what gave you that impression? Like, did we all just watch that last segment? Like, there's a lot of love here. Is there? Like, truly, you have one person saying, we're honestly. Okay, we're back from commercial break. And uh, Andy's like, well, this season, Garcelle faced quite the balancing act from movie premieres to teaching our boys to become young men to facing difficult discussions with friends. Let's watch. And we have the uh, montage of Garcelle from the Black Girl Missing movie that she executive produced. Uh, and then, of course, the scenes with Jax, uh, you know, very kind of interpersonal scenes about her relationship with her sons where the first episode of the season, she said, you know, listen, I'm happy my son's being honest, but it makes me feel like a failure. And then they were even talking about her ex-husband, Mike Nylon, cheating on uh, on her back in the day. And, you know, that we found out the kids Googled it, that, you know, knew exactly that the dad had cheated. 
on her and Garcella not known that of course uh in Vegas she let the ladies know that it's like I don't know if I trust you guys when it comes to my family and Dreet's like to say that I don't trust you with my kids that to me it hits right in my heart I trust you with Jagaloo and Phoenix Garcelle's like, this is my problem with Dorit. She takes things and then makes them personal, and then she becomes a victim. And that is interesting. It's a pattern of behavior that seems to be pointed out with Dorit in terms of these women. We saw it a little bit just right now with Kyle uh, at Crystal's Taco Tuesday, which will live in infamy forever. This Taco Tuesday. And Garcelle's like, when I said it to Erica, we were all having a good time. And Dorit forcefully is like, but we are. I'm having a good time, you guys. And Garcelle's like, if you have to say it like that, we're not having a good time. I'm saying it because you just attacked me. And Garcelle's like, I feel like for you and your privilege, I can't. I can't. And Eric and her talking head's like, the word of attack has a different meaning when it comes from a white woman to a black woman. It just does. I don't think Doreen needs to hurt Garcelle, but it does hurt Garcelle. But this is another thing, right? I feel like we've had this conversation or things of this nature in regards to Dorit, uh, you know, many seasons. And even Erica knows it, you know? It's like that another pattern of behavior. Like, why is Dorit constantly late when that pattern of, be when that behavior is pointed out to her, she still does it. It's the same thing with this, but it's much darker because it's actually respecting, you know, somebody's conversation about race and ethnicity, you know? And then, of course, we had that lunch with Garcelle and Dorit. Uh, and Garcelle like levies the, it feels like an unconscious Karen behavior with you, which is just wow. And then at Barcelona, um, Dorit's like, I want to learn and know more about your plight. It's never good when we use the word plight in a friendly conversation. But Garcelle's like, I, I'd like to get to know more as well. And, you know, and they hug. So we have a tense negotiation and a hug at the end of this season. Garcelle and Atagonet goes, I don't think Dorit is malicious or mean, but that's all I really wanted for her to hear me. And that's really, that's it. We all want to hear each other, right? We should be curious about each other and, and what, you know, how to respect people in this world. That's what it's all about, right? So, uh, you know, Andy's like, well, you had a great year in front of and behind the camera. And, uh, Andy's like that scene at the beach with the boys, it was rough. Are you being more selective with your work projects? And she says, Hey, listen, uh, I did this, you know, the reality show. So I could be home more. Uh, she, he also says, you said on the after show that you wish Mike, her ex had been the one to tell the boys about his infidelity. What was his reaction to learning that Jax had Googled it? And has he talked to the boys about it yet? And Garcelle shakes her head. He would never talk to me about it, nor the boys, which is why I take on that responsibility. And Andy's like, he still hasn't talked to the boys about it. And she's like, this is why I take on so much responsibility with talking about sex, talking about feelings, because if they don't get it from me, they're not going to get it anywhere else. That's really interesting though, right? Like, and I don't know what the reality of that is, you know, if that's totally a hundred percent, the actual reality of that situation. But I will say men talking to other men. And I, I mean, I will always say, and I, I, I say this lovingly, you know, I remember my mom had to make my dad, you know, and well, how old was I? Oh gosh, you guys, I think I'm like 12 or 13, 13, probably. Right. No, 12. I don't know. He had, my mom made him talk to me about the birds and the bees. And, you know, growing up, you always heard the birds and the bees on TV, but you know, my dad was like, uh, well, I, uh, when I talk to you about the uh, birds and the bees, do, do you know it? And do you know about that? And I was like, yep. And he's like, great talk. Good talk. Good talk. We did it. And I was like, great, good, good. You know, it was just uncomfortable for both of us. And I got to tell you, I didn't know what the, like, listen, folks, I still haven't had sex. I don't even know what I'm like. I don't even know. Like, what are we talking? What are we talking about here? No, I just remember those things. And it's like, sometimes when men, other men, you know, like it's this iron John thing where you keep it all in. Not me. I have a podcast, but other people. Um, anyways, Andy's like, okay, so I want to move on to the tension that boiled over between Garcelle and Dorit this year. It started in Vegas. Um, and Dorit, it seemed to hurt you more than anyone else. And Dorit's like, listen, we're all mothers, you know, it made me sad. It, it hurt me to hear that a friend of mine doesn't trust me. And Garcelle's like, well, it also hurt my feelings to watch friends of mine laugh at the situation of a 14 year old being cussed at. We have that flashback to two seasons ago at Garcelle's birth or it was last season, Garcelle's birthday party at Kyle's house. Um, you know, after Garcelle's birthday party where Erica Jane was like, get the fuck out of here. Ah! When Jackson, the other, you know, when they went in to pick up the flowers and Erica's like, get the fuck out. Get the fuck out. And remember then Kyle PK and Dorit 
and Mauricio were all just laughing about it. Well, actually, Dorit wasn't laughing about it, but everybody else was. Kyle's like, you guys, did you miss what Erica said to Garcelle's son, the 14-year-old, to go fuck off? And she's like, ha, 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 ha. And PK's like, I know. And Dorit's like, oh, I was there. And Kyle laughing. It's like, I mean, it's not funny, but it is funny. And Mauricio's like, I think it's great she did that. I'm so high right now, love me. I think it's great. <laughs> but Kyle does have mean girl tendencies, but it's like that kind of average all-American mean girl tendencies, you know? Like Kyle would probably be a blast to hang out with outside of the show. Anyways, Garcelle goes, so let's call it even. And Dorit goes, I completely understand that, but it seems like you're holding onto a grudge of that. And Garcelle goes, it was adding to it, Dorit. So I felt the way I felt because I saw the scene and then me sharing my feelings, you being defensive and not letting me just have my feelings. And you're like, it happened a year ago. You should be fine. It's not that it was. And Garcelle interrupts. It was that though. It wasn't singling you out. That's why I feel like when people are guilty, they take it on. And Dorit goes, I just felt sad. I felt sad that you felt that way. And Crystal goes, then just say that. Then just say that. That's, you know, it all boils down to that. Like effective communication, uh, effective communicators, reliable narrators. That's what these shows kind of rise and fall on is that you have these people in the cast that are, are effective communicators and then you have people that aren't, but then think they are and they get themselves into a lot of trouble. Now, Dorit is nowhere near, say, a Tom Sandoval, but it's it's in the same ballpark at times. It's just that she thinks of herself and presents as very highfalutin and classy. So then when she gets herself in trouble by the phrases that she speaks, it sometimes can be a little bit of something that will open up to be made fun of because she does consider herself. So I am upper crust, you know. So uh, Andy goes, so Garcelle, you don't believe Dorita's racist, but you do believe that she's an unconscious Karen. And Garcelle goes, Sorry, I did the uh, Garcelle voice. For, anyways, Garcelle goes, well, just unaware, Andy. Just, you know, just not. I feel like the word attack just seemed unnecessary for me saying, no, no, no. You're just trying to embarrass her. And uh, <laughs> sorry, Juliana put in a note of Sutton kissing her driver incident. Uh, Dorit goes, I don't know all the words. I don't know all the words, all the things. Finally, we get a real statement. I don't know all the words. I don't know adjectives, nouns, verbs. I don't know any of that junk. I don't even know the alphabet. Nope. Uh, and Dorit goes, but, you know, you also have to judge on character, you know, and intent. You know, I would never deliberately hurt you, okay? And if you do, by the way, otherwise, then tell me. And Garcel goes, you were attacked by strangers. And Dorit interjects, and robbed. And Garcel goes, and robbed. You were held at gunpoint. You were attacked. You know the difference. You lived straight, you, you know, you lived through strangers in your house with guns and your children in their bedrooms, which is horrific. But yet you say to me that I attacked you when you know what an attack is. So she's making that big point of that is an attack. But Garcelle going, no, 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 is not an attack. And so that is something that you cannot levy out there. And it's one of those things that we've been told time and time again. Dorit has been told that. And then Anna Marie now, though, raises her hand and goes, <laughs> did anybody call a conversation about esophagus? Here I am. Can I chime in here for a second? And Dorit goes, please. And for Dorit to say, please, it's like one of those things of like, please. Oh, shit, it's you. No, I'm good. I'm good. Please. No. But Anna Marie throws in and she's like, okay, I just want to say something. And Andy, it looks kind of confused, potentially annoyed. And Anna Marie's like, you guys were having a conversation and you said to Dorit, you don't call black women angry. You don't call black women aggressive. And Garcelle kind of annoyed goes, yes, I know what I said. And Anna Marie's like, when we were sitting at Sutton's store and I was unfortunately asking you about your esophagus, we did it, folks. She brought up esophagus and Sutton, Sutton said to me, why are you yelling at me when I was clearly not yelling at her? And we get a flashback to Sutton's boutique anniversary party 10 months earlier. And Sutton's like, well, you're not my doctor. What are you saying? And Anna Marie's yelling. I get it. But you're saying things that don't make sense. And Sutton's like, well, don't yell at me. And Anna Marie yelling goes, well, I'm sorry. I don't mean to yell, but I'm just like, and Sutton's like, well, don't yell at me then. I will say there's a little bit of difference in the fact that Anna Marie is actually admitting in the scene that she is yelling. Anyways, Anna Marie's like, I'm not. I don't mean to yell at you. And Dorit's like, she's not yelling at you. And Garcelle closes her eyes in torment listening. But listen, this is Anne Marie's um, feelings on the subject. Uh, but I will say 
you do have to look at the natural alignment and she is standing up for Dorit in this, you know, backing her up. And what do you guys think about that? I mean, I did think that Anna Marie was, I mean, also, you know, we're talking about intent. What was Anna Marie's intent to talk about Sutton's esophagus for the entirety of the season? Like to me, that was something that was like, where is this com- coming from? And I remember even saying probably in recaps going, why is she so aggressive about this? It was like a dog with a bone. And I just didn't understand the why of it all. Like, I just felt like it was a freshman trying to do too much in a show of trying to make their mark coming in six episodes into a season and going, I'm here. Look at me. I'm going to like really make my stamp. And it was like, it, so it was, I don't know. To me also, this was a thing that's been happening between Dorit and Garcelle for many seasons. But anyways, Anna Marie's like, and you were right there. You didn't say anything, Garcelle. That, and Garcelle goes, we all yell at each other. And Anna Marie's like, no, no, guys, I'm talking. I'm talking. I'm a black woman too. And that is somebody weaponizing me as a black woman trying to make me look aggressive. And Garcelle's like, well, you can stand up for yourself. And Anna Marie's like, I'm talking. I'm still talking. And Garcelle goes, well, you were doing perfectly fine that entire night. And Anna Marie goes, still talking. And you can tell there's no love lost for Anna Marie. And Anna Marie does present herself in a certain way, but I can't really speak to this. I'm not a black woman. I can't speak to this. You do have to take her by her word on her own experience. Um, but I will say, if we're talking about intent, as Dorit says, I do question a lot of the time Anna Marie's intent in any conversation. And there does seem to be a you know, she does seem to fall into correcting others a lot. Take that for how whatever it's worth. Anyways, uh, Anna Marie's like, so I was being weaponized as a black woman trying to imply that I am yelling at her when I'm clearly not. Who stood up for me? And no one answers. And Anna Marie's like, this one did. And she points at Dorit. So now Dorit, you know, she's saying none of this can be true because she stood up for me that night. And Garcelle's like, okay. And Andy's like, well, I want to take it back to Dorit. Did you and Garcelle finish it? Like Andy's like, okay, Anna Marie, thanks. Uh, I'd like to take it back to where I was. And Anna Marie seems kind of like, what? Why did I get cut off? Uh, <laughs> Anna Marie, this is your first year. Why are you even talking? Like, that's where, like, Mary, Co- we do need, we need Mary Cosby right here. Like, what's this bobblehead talking right now? What are we doing? What are we doing? Like, that's, we need, like, a Mary Cosby, like, rollout, like Hannibal Lecter and Silence of the Lambs. Just roll Mary Cosby out in certain, like, every reunion for every iteration of Housewives. And she just roasts everybody on the stage. Anyways. Dorit goes, Garcelle labeled me in the assumption. And Garcelle goes, well, you also labeled me as angry or attacking, attacking, attacking. And then that changes somebody's perception when they meet me, right? And Dorit goes, I didn't label you as attacking me. And Garcelle goes, you said you attacked me. And Dorit goes, yes, that is used all the time. If you go back and look, I would say thousands and thousands of times. (laughs) Go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Garcelle is like, but you were saying it to me. And Dorit goes, you said I live in a bubble. And Garcelle goes, right. We flash back again to Taco Tuesday nine months earlier where Garcelle says, Dorit lives in a bit of a bubble. And, uh, you know, it just triggers me. We live in a world now we're aware, we're woke, which I hate that word, but, you know, whatever you want to say, and I feel like she's not in that world. Garcelle making that point about Dorit. And Garcelle is in the reunion goes, and then you went online and you said, I'm happily living in my bubble. You doubled down. And that is, Dorit does that. Like, Dorit, Dorit doesn't really... She's not good in group scenes. She's not good with defending herself or making points. But what she is good at is saying snarky comments and talking heads away from the ladies or posting a little snarky Instagram thing. And that's what she did. I'm happily living in my bubble. And Dorit's like, Garcelle. And Garcelle goes, well, it just felt like, wow, this girl is really clueless. And Dorit goes, in hindsight, it was a big mistake on my part. And Garcelle goes, then why didn't you take it down? Because first of all, Dorit's like, it got so many likes. No, and Crystal goes, well, I, th- I think you did it twice. And Dorit's like, no. And Crystal's like, didn't you do two posts? And we she see a post of Dorit's IG of another picture with three PK, Jagger, and Phoenix with a caption under it. The only bubble I live in is a love bubble. So she did two bubble posts. The, the, the second bubble post really set it off. And Dorit goes, the next one was to clarify the only bubble I live in. Dorit's still trying to, no, no, no. You can understand. I realized the first one was weird. And then I wanted to clarify what kind of bubble. It was a family bubble. Those bubbles are cool. Garcelle turns to Crystal and goes, I can't. I can't. You know, Garcelle's a 
I'm just so tired. And Dorit's like, do you really believe that I was doing that to stick up my middle finger? And Garcelle goes, well, that's what it was perceived as, Dorit. It kind of, well, I mean, it does seem like a middle finger, right? And Andy laughs. Well, it, it didn't really land, Dorit. And Garcelle's like, Dorit. And Andy goes, what do you think? Do you think it landed, that it landed? And Dorit goes, no, it most certainly did not land. Huh. I'm asking do you think I did that? Do you think that's my intentions? And Garcelle goes, yes, yes. It was like you were doubling down on it. And Andy frowns and then laughs. And he's like, it didn't, it just, did. it was, you know, cut and run, cut and run. And Dorit goes, okay, well, I didn't want to leave it like I didn't care or that I was sticking my middle finger up. I wanted to clarify, I don't live in a bubble. <laughs> but then she did another. I know, Garcelle, they're very big, big accusations. They're big accusations. And Garcelle goes, so was the word you used for me. And Andy goes, listen, two things can be true. We always say that on the show. Two things can be true at once. And I think one thing I learned is that it's really important to kind of listen and say less. Because a lot of times in situations like this, where where do you go from here? I guess is the bigger question. So Andy's now trying to bring it back. Of like, you know, earlier we had the Dorit Kyle, like, oh, I think there's a great friendship here. I think there's a lot, you know, I think there's a lot of hope here. And this one, he's like, okay, uh, uh, how do we, where do we go from here? Right? Where do we go from here? And Erica goes, to a break. I need one. I'm about to shit myself. Yeah. And Kyle laughs. And Dorit's like, tell me this. Do you like me, Garcelle? And Garcelle pauses and goes, sometimes. And Kyle's like, zoinks, what? Like, whoa. And Dorit's like, do you have a problem with me? And Garcelle goes, well, there's something, obviously. Obviously, yes. Obviously. Do you want to try to work? through it? Do you want to have a friendship? Do you want to do trust falls with me? And Garcelle pauses and goes, I'm not sure. Okay. 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 And then he goes, all right, I want to move on. That was great. And obviously our work with the two of you is not done. Uh, for this year it is though. Let's shift to something not so heavy. If you ever hear someone in this group moaning with pleasure, it's usually over a Birkin or some diamonds or on a tattoo table. But when it comes to sex stop, Sex talk, the Beverly Hills women aren't afraid to let their freak flags fly. Watch this. And we go to a clip package. So it was a very sexy season for the ladies of Beverly Hills. We had conversations about scissoring, you know, Kyle and uh, Kyle and Dorit on the grass. Sorry, on the grass demonstrating scissoring by laying down and combining their legs together where they meet in a V, folks. So just pick, that's what scissoring, just your scissoring, that's what that is. We also had the magic mic with a sexy lap dance where, you know, Sutton was like, I can't do this. I'm on the board of two minor league baseball teams at a ballet company. I don't, I'm not going to do no dick riding at Magic Mike, even though she wore pants. We had that. We had Garcelle talking about uh, being on Bumble and Sutton's like, well, I've never been accepted to Raya. And Chris is like, you haven't? And Garcelle teasing Sutton, no, Raya. They're like, we don't know you. And Sutton in the talking head was like, it's hard to find somebody and I don't have fake boobs. I say, I say, what am I going to do? And then we had girls night out where Sutton revealed that sometimes she makes out with her driver. I, you know, listen, move over Andy Cohen. What about Sutton making out with her driver? That's wild. We had Sutton riding the mechanical bull, uh, not doing a good job. And Eric in a talking head going, if Sutton's bull riding skills are anything like her dick riding skills, no wonder she's not getting a second date. And he's like, all right, um, Garcelle at Magic Mike, you seem to light up with the dancer's abs in your vicinity. Was it his abs that caught your eye or something else? And they show us a still shot of Garcelle's stunned face, mouth gaping open with the guy's bare chest standing in front of her. And Garcelle goes, oh, it was the whole package, Andy. And Andy's like, OK, Bravo Buddy said Crystal said Dorit hasn't seen a real body part in 10 years. Oh, wow. Dorit, what's your response? And Dorit goes, I know. I'd love to understand what exactly do you think other than my boobs? is fake on me. And Crystal very demurely just smiles and pauses and goes, I was just being funny. And Dory goes, funny. Now in the trailer, they made it look like Andy Cohen was laughing. And Dory was like, don't you dare, Andy, don't you dare. And everybody was like, oh, it's about her nose. But this is this is actually what the, this scene was about, was, you know, Crystal saying I was just being funny. And then Andy goes, Sutton, when you were on the bull, Erica said if Sutton's bull riding skills are anything like her dick riding skills, it's no wonder she's not getting a second date. Uh, rebuttal. And Sutton's like, well, no. 
and everyone laughs and he's like, okay, all right. And so it's like, well, the bull riding is tough. I got to tell you, it's not like Santos. And Eric is like, it's very tough. It's very tough. And Kyle's like, it was hard. And Sutton's like, that sounds like, well, the other riding is much easier. When I'm with my driver, I say, I say, there's a natural rhythm. It's, you know, the motion in the ocean. Yeah, it's like a gigantic waterbed. I say, I say, I do love Erica giving, like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> Erica's used to climbing, like, on top of, like, 70 plus year old men. Like, it's, I'm so sorry that Erica is, like, the master dick rider that every, like, how, God. Anyways. And he's like, Coco NX wants to know when you made out with the driver, who and when, and says, well, I'm not going to give, you know, I'm not going to give that information. And Andy's like, do you all share drivers? And Erica's like, do I? And Andy's like, no, 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 you may use the same car services is what I'm saying. So I wonder if anyone, and Erica's like, I haven't seen anyone worth it. And Andy's like, it's your personal guy, son? And son's like, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And Andy's like, and was it more than once? And son's like, maybe. <laughs> and Andy goes, well, I want a driver with benefits. Andy, stop saying things like this. At this point, we got to lock it down, Andy. And son's like, well, he's good looking too. <laughs> all right. <laughs> like Sutton, I do. Now I'm getting, this is what sucks about all this fucking litigious shit is now I'm like worried every time these ladies or Andy opens their mouth and I'm like, we can't have a conversation because now I'm worried like this driver is going to go Sue Sutton. And anyways, Andy's like, wow, good for you. Wow. Kyle, in season 10, no, I, I, would, I would love it if Andy was like, wow, good for you. Hey, Kyle, are you going down on Morgan Wade? No, she goes, uh, he goes, Kyle, in season 10, we saw you very finicky about the implication that you and Freddie were romantically entangled. Now that you're scissoring Dorit and saying that you date a woman, what changed? Really well-written question. Because he was managed to get in her friend, Teddy Mellencamp, and then also bring it back to, it seems like you've changed your position in terms of scissoring through that scene. And Kyle goes, I have changed. I mean, I grew up, you know, everything had to be by the book. Everything your mom teaches you that you have to think and believe. And this last year and a half, I have changed, and I don't know what the future holds. So why wouldn't I say maybe? And Andy goes, okay, good. And son's like, well, I, I, Kyle, I don't, I don't think any of us would be judgmental or care. You know, we would be supportive. You know, it doesn't matter if you, if you want to go down on a muff, Kyle, I think we would all stand up and applaud. I say, I say, we, we won't, you know, let your freak flag fly, Kyle, please. I do think this is very interesting. It's very telling. But also there is something to that of, you know, if you've read about Kyle's history with Big Kath, her mom, of course, Kathy Hilton, uh, you know, it's a very and I think a lot of households are like this. You are raised to think a certain way. And so I think she is, you know, in some ways, you know, letting us know about her personal revelation she's had over the last couple of years. Anyways, Kyle looks at Sutton like, shut the fuck up. And Andy's like, absolutely. Well, that's kind. And Sutton smiles at Kyle. Kyle does not look at Sutton. I just like, I love that Kyle just does not know how to handle herself on the hot seat. So she's constantly probably just in, in internal turmoil. And he goes, new wife, busy mom and fitness fanatic Anna Marie was rated in 8.5 by her husband, which to be fair is a solid B. But questions about her job title, title in Sutton's esophagus has Crystal calling her a B as well as a few other names. Watch. And we have a clip package of Anna Marie. It's Kyle's new friend married to Marcellus Wiley, who is an ex NFL football player. And look up Marcellus Wiley, you guys, if you want a little more information about Anna Marie and what she's been going through. Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, articles about Marcellus out there. And that's why I do think Anna Marie should potentially think if she does get an offer for season two, uh, if she should do it or not. I think uh, she's realizing this was tough in so many ways. And you do leave yourself open uh, to criticism, also to compliments, but a lot of criticism, especially in certain ways of how she behaved this season. Um, I don't know if this is the right place for her because it just would get potentially worse. And I know she holds certain beliefs about trans rights and things like that, that I think could really be a sticky situation for her and her husband. Uh, I do think there is a world in which she does get a contract just based off her and Crystal's relationship. Like, I almost think like, it's like, you know, Crystal's pretty good at shutting it down. But at the same time, I don't know really how a producer thinks. Does a producer go, okay, well, listen, that Crystal's handling herself pretty well. We want to see that it makes her come out of her shell even more. Maybe that's a good person to put out there, but I just don't know if Anna Marie can actually handle it. Um, Anna Marie uh, tells us the eight and a half thing in a clip. And I just still think that is just wild to say. And then it's a wild thing to repeat on national television. 
Anyways, we had uh, Sutton's boutique party about the esophagus and Sutton and uh, Crystal and a talking head going, I don't know Anna Marie well, but that bitch is nosy. We had Crystal on FaceTime with Garcelle saying, when I met Anna Marie at around Christmas, she told me she was a doctor. And Garcelle was like, and not a nurse. And then the homeless, not toothless gal scenes. Sutton's like, I have a board certified doctor, a GI that I've seen. And Anna Marie's like, well, I am a trained to be a critical thinker. So when I hear something like this, I'm... And Anna Marie's like, Crystal, didn't you want to go to med school? If you'd gone to med school, you'd get that. And Crystal's like, did you go to med school? Did you tell me you were an anesthesiologist when I met you? And Anna Marie's like, here we go, like downplaying my profession again. And Crystal's like, let me tell you something. No, 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 no. You are such a bitch. What is wrong with you? This is after many scenes that Crystal was finally pushed to a breaking point. And Andy goes, all right. Lots to talk about, including a certain esophagus, but we'll get to that later. First ladies, are you surprised that Anna Marie is proud of her 8.5? And they're all shaking their heads. Yes. And Anna Marie's like, well, my husband and I are best friend. Like that is my homie, right? Like we can joke about things like that. I just like that. Like that's my homie. He can call me a piece of shit. And Andy's like, well, how would you rate him? And Anna Marie's like, he's like an 8.5 too. And Kyle's like, you can't get more than that. And Erica's like, no, that's not why. And Andy goes, well, I want to express my condolences to you. I know your mom recently passed. What can you tell us about her? And Andy passes tissues to her. And Andy's like, what was her name? And she says her name was Jane. She had this terrible cough. So I made her a doctor's appointment and they found an eight by seven centimeter tumor in her lung. And it's been a hard year and all this was going on. And Erica's like, while she was filming and Andy was like filming the show and you didn't share it with the others. And Anna Marie's like, at a certain point, I was like, I don't want to. I just want to compartmentalize and not have to. And Andy goes, I'm sorry. And before we get on to the turn that Andy makes, I do want to say, man, my heart goes out to Anna Marie for that. But I would also argue a little bit that like, I wish more than anything that she would have shared that. This is the place to do it. The fact that you thought it was better for you to argue about an esophagus than actually what was going on in your reality. Like we joke about these shows and talk about the weirdness of them, but at a certain point, they do actually tackle really hard issues that I think sometimes really does help people. Listen, you guys all know I lost my mom six months ago. I would have really wanted to know what she was actually going through. It would have made me have so much more empathy, would have made me understand a little bit more why she, why she was lashing out at bullshit things knowing the insanity that she must have been going through. This is what these shows are about. I'm telling you, if she had been, and that's why I was like, why wasn't she encouraged to? Like, did you just keep it a secret from everybody? This is what this is for. This is what this platform is for. She could have used this. Like, I mean, my heart does go out to her in this situation. And I just so like, what a failure on the show's part for not being able to get her to share this. Cause I think it would have just made a world of difference for her. And he goes, uh, well, okay. I want to make a little bit of a right turn. Uh, bringing back to one of the first times we met you on the show, you really wasted no time kind of calling things as you saw them. The third kind said, Anna Marie is going to be an opinionated newbie. I can tell she certainly has no problem getting her thoughts across. And then we go to Kyle's THC dinner and, uh, you know, Anne Marie talking about like Kyle's jewelry and like, why can't Kyle get jewelry? And why can't, I mean, I don't understand. Is that what we're saying essentially? And, and he's like, you seem very confident, Anna Marie. And Anna Marie's like, um, I am, I always do speak my mind and I'm always very honest with things that I observe and see, because I feel like that's truly the only way to get to know people. And Andy's like, it all wasn't positive feedback. In some viewers eyes, you could do no right. What was the hardest part about the negative feedback? And she's like, I can take criticism because I was an athlete. You know, I grew up being criticized my whole life. Like you need to do this. You need to do this better. But I did internalize it and I do internalize it. My whole point though, you guys, is that these shows are to externalize. It is TV. The camera does pick up the truth behind your eyes, but we are not mind readers. The camera is not a mind reader. You can't internalize. Reality television forces you to externalize. So the internalize, especially when you are a first season newbie, it does not help you at all. And the athlete thing is like, you can't live your life entirely like an athlete. In certain situations, it just doesn't help. And Andy's like, yeah, there's no preparing anyone for the criticism that comes when you come on a show like this. 
Uh, and he goes, you met Crystal before joining the group. What did you think of her then? And was she the same or different on the show? And Anna Marie's like, Crystal was awesome off camera. And then when the cameras went up, it was just a different tune. And Andy goes, we saw you tell Garcelle that when you first met Anna Marie, she claimed to be a doctor, anesthesiologist, and anesthetist are two very similar words. Is it possible that you misheard her? And Crystal's like, no, my sister, I have a half sister who's an anesthesiologist. So we had that conversation and you said, Anna Marie said, I'm an anesthesiologist. And I said, oh, my sister's an anesthesiologist and she has a private practice at Cedars. And you said, oh, I'm a nurse anesthetist and people don't know the difference. And Anna Marie says, I'm going to tell everybody now what really happened. So when Crystal and I first met, I asked, what do you do? And she answered, I'm a housewife. And Crystal's like, no one talks like that. I would never walk in and say, hi, I'm a housewife. And I don't talk like that. Like, and that is very true. Like Crystal also that thing of like, when uh, the cameras are off, she's awesome. And the cameras are like, I've, it just doesn't. And like knowing Crystal a little bit, like, you know, she just doesn't walk into situations flaunting. Like it just doesn't seem to be her bag, but okay. But I will say Anna Marie's like, you know, you can kind of tell a little bit of how Anna Marie holds herself and, and, and presents herself. So it's interesting. And I do think, uh, it seems like Anna Marie has a pattern of behavior of fibbing or bending the truth. And her observations usually are tried to put down somebody else in the long run. Anyways, Anna Marie's like, the only reason that I'm not talking over you right now, Crystal, is because I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to talk over you. I'm not going to argue. So now she's pulling this instead of actually just listening, like, guys, this is the part to actually have this conversation. But I hate when people do that of like, I'm not going to yell. So I'm just going to be quiet. And it's like, no, we want to hear what you have to say. Don't use that as an excuse to not actually defend what we're talking about. And Crystal goes, well, you have proven to be a liar. And Anna Marie's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Did you not? And Crystal's like, did you not? And Anna Marie's like, did you not insinuate? And Crystal says, like, did you not say that I said that Sutton has an eating disorder twice? And Anna Marie's like, okay, I'm not, we'll get to that. Did you not insinuate? And Crystal goes, you have proven to be a liar. And Anna Marie's like, I'm yelling. I'm not going to yell. I'm not yelling. And Anna's like, ladies, who do you believe? And Erica's like, I knew she was a nurse and nasty test. And Crystal's like, of course, because you're on the show. And Erica's like, I'm just telling you my experience. And Chris was like, we're talking about when I met her prior. And Kyle goes, she did. She told me on camera what she did. And I still thought she was a doctor. So I can see where there would be confusion. And Crystal goes, I think you intentionally misrepresent because people don't know the difference. And Anna Marie's like, can I explain why it's such a big deal? And Anna's like, yeah, explain why it's a big deal. American Society of Anesthesiologists and the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology, there are a lot of political issues that exist there. It's almost like there's a market turf war. So now she's bringing in these two associations saying it's like the fucking East Coast, West Coast rappers of the 90s and saying there's like turf war when it's like, girl, just admit you fucking like bended the truth a little bit instead of pulling down like American associations of nurses into the what, which by the way, these people have come out and spoken out against you at times. Kyle goes, for what reason? Is it because a doctor and the nurse can do the same thing? And Anna was like, yes. And Kyle's like, they can do the same thing and they're taking business from them. And Eric's like, for a different price. And it's like, they're paying less. And Chris is like, and I was telling you the truth and it'd be easier if you just said it that you sometimes blur the line, but how you weaponize your profession against Sutton, that's when I was like, I had it, but it's the truth. And Andy goes, Anna Marie, why did Sutton's story about her esophagus bother you so much? Man, exactly. And uh, Anna Marie's like, I guess the way it was presented to me was just really odd, but I just want to say this, watching everything back, seeing how I behaved, how I handled the entire situation, I just want to apologize to you because I can't even tell you how much I hated watching it. And I truly wonder if she hated watching it or she finally obviously pays attention to all of this, realized how badly we hated watching it. And Sutton's like, well, I wasn't angry about the esophagus. It was that, that going behind my back and talking about it and saying I had an eating disorder and then I was hiding behind this ailment to have an eating disorder. That was really hurtful, I say, I say. Which, by the way, Sutton went too far last night. She literally posted a picture of her esophagus in her stories. And like, I was like, shit, Sutton started an OnlyFans. Like, I was like, this is like a dirty picture. And then she's like, my esophagus. I was like, Jesus, I was about to report her to Instagram. I was like, what the fuck am I looking at? Like, my God. So, well, like, look at all this, this all pink and nice and pretty, my dainty esophagus. Anyways, Andy goes, right. We uh, got a lot of response from viewers who were thanking you for spreading an awareness about it. Viewers who suffered from it and says like, who knew so many people had esophageal issues? I will say this, no joke. 
when this, these episodes were happening during the season, I would get so many messages about people or their, you know, or their partners going through the same thing. Like no joke. Like I legitimately got a lot of messages. I did. I wasn't aware it was this common either. Anyways, Eric is like, you brought awareness. Yeah. And Amber's like, it, in not a very not and, and he's like well a very roundabout way the most worst way possible and Annemarie's like I'm I'm very sorry I'm very sorry and Dree goes feels very genuine and son's like well yeah you know it's a lesson learned we all make mistakes in this group okay and God knows Erica I, he, she married Dom Gerard for money I say, I say you know anyways during the break Kyle's suddenly all perky and she's like guys listen to what Vanderpump did she met she's talking about Lisa she met Crystal and she said and who are you? And Crystal had to say, I'm on the show. And she said, is Kyle still on? Oh, fuck you. Can you believe this? Kyle is obsessed with Lisa Vanderpump. I want Lisa to come back to Beverly Hills when she closes. Wolf, the sexiest restaurant in town. Oh, yes. Wolf. Anyways, I love when Kyle gets a little bit of Lisa Vanderpump tea. And he's like, welcome back to the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills reunion. Well, a few people in this group have accused Crystal of not speaking up. But when Anna Marie met her blood boil, Crystal found her voice real quick. Watch. And we have these, uh, you know, the Crystal scenes where she was getting a lap dance at the Magic Mike show. Crystal to her husband, Rob, saying the girls are also skinny now. Somehow, sometimes I can't focus. We have a montage of all the girls coming like, you know, Kyle's like, are you the incredible shrinking woman to Erica? I mean, remember even the finale, they were like skinny mini and Erica's like, you lost weight. I mean, it is why we just got to accept that people really do put such an insane pressure on themselves and really look down at other people in terms of their body and themselves and wait, it's just one of those things. It's, it's really interesting. I've, I've been through that myself. Um, anyways, more crystal speaking to Rob and Rob's like, listen, I think you have a lot of very strong opinions. You just need to share them with them. And then we have a scene of crystal to the ladies. Why do I have to get to a point to like scream for people to listen? This group wants me to scream all the fucking time. And then Anna Marie in Spain is saying, let's talk about the Crystal situation. The first thing Crystal said to me about this group of women was you ladies were not intelligent. Nobody was educated and you're all very shallow. And Crystal in a talking head's like, that's false. I never said those things. Also, I do find it hard to believe also that Crystal then walks into a party, says, I'm a housewife, and then goes, those ladies are bitches just to like whoever's out there to listen. Like it's a small town at the end of the day. I do find that hard to believe. Um... We do have a flashback to Crystal saying, no, these women are quite savvy, but they're clearly not highly educated. Dorita and the talking head's like, by the way, child bride, while you have been getting married at 12, the rest of us were building businesses, graduating college, doing things, you know, to educate ourselves. Crystal at Anna Marie's diamond brunch going, you know, we have bumps in the road, but we have to just agree to disagree to Anna Marie. My intention was and is to move on. And Anna Marie's like, I really do want to move forward. Crystal on the talking head says, I genuinely thought that Anna Marie would move on when pigs flew. So I'm like, wow. And he's like, all right, you told Rob, your husband, the reason that you're quiet in the group settings is because you're preoccupied, preoccupied thinking about how skinny everybody is. And Crystal's like, yeah, everyone has gotten very thin in the last two years. I spent my life feeling uncomfortable in my own skin all the time. So I'm constantly comparing, looking since I was 11. It's just, it's part of my existence, man. I relate to this so much, not even just about body, but just about insecurity in general. Like people will always like, well, why do you feel that way? And it's like, I don't know. I was born that way. Been that way since I was a little kid. And then you have decades of your own negative thought patterns in your head. And you're like, yeah, try to break that shit. Like, you know, you can go to all the therapy you want and you still have to do these fucking exercises to like talk yourself off a ledge. I mean, these things are real. And just because they're not real to you, because you're blessed with having a mind that actually pr probably works more correctly, you've got to be empathetic to other people and accept that these things are the reality for some people. Like you might look at Kristen and go, wow, that is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. But you have to understand that she might not feel that way about herself sometimes and has to think about this on a daily, if not hourly basis. You guys all know somebody like this. I mean, it, it, I think it is so common. And I think sometimes we still don't seem to believe it, even though we have personal experience with it. Anyways, Andy's like, at the homeless, not toothless event, we saw a side of you that we had never seen, including shouting bitch loud enough for half the bathroom to hear. What was it about Anna Marie in this moment that pushed you? You can tell Andy's like a proud papa here. You said bitch out loud. Chris was like, well, it was actually because it was about an eating disorder. So it was like the one thing that I would never say about someone because I suffer daily minute by minute. So it was like, I felt like I was crazy. So she's saying like, I would never say that about Sutton because of my own ED. 
And Anna Marie's like, there was more to that conversation. That's why I said it. And Chris was like, are you ever going to apologize to me for saying that I said she had an eating disorder? And Anna Marie's like, I didn't say you had an eating disorder. I said, Sutton, Crystal did not say you had an eating disorder. I didn't say you had an eating disorder, period. Neither of us said you had an eating disorder. We do not think you have an eating disorder. Don't all of a sudden be a we, Anna Marie. You're not a we with Crystal. You did insinuate it. Like, this is the, like, Anna Marie does not accept responsibility for anything. And she talks the long way around everything. Anyway, son's like, mm, good, because I don't. And Chris is like, it's crazy. And Anne's like, well, as we moved into Spain, Anna Marie claimed that Crystal called all of you shallow, uneducated, fake socialites. Crystal, you denied it. What did you make of the interview tape saying none of these ladies were highly educated? And Kyle's like, I believe she said that because she intimated things like that by saying, no, those are big words for you. And Crystal's like, but this is why I always say this to people. They will ask me, I say, we have dumb ass conversations. And Eric is like, we knew that. And Anna Marie's like, also, another thing I wanted to say is she was like, there have been like instances where you have been like, you know, less than truthful, like you denied it and later admitted to saying it. And Chris was like, don't throw rocks. You have proven you constantly lie on the show. Oh, sorry. That's Crystal, not Tariq. Tariq. Crystal goes, don't throw rocks, Anna Marie. You have proven you constantly lie on the show. So I wouldn't do that. And Anna Marie's like, she was insinuating that Sutton was racist because she said something so dark. And then you said, oh, it's just a feeling. You made it up. And Chris was like, no, I never made it up. And Anna Marie's like, you lie about your 14 friends. And now you lie about me. And I'm like, I don't want to be a part of that. Man, Anna Marie really watches the show for someone who says they don't know anything about the show. That uh, Crystal's first and second season, like that's wild. Anna Marie paid very close attention. This is like shit that like then kind of weirds me out. It's like, girl, if you did watch the show, why didn't you take better notes for the way you should have acted? Anyways, Crystal whispers to Garcelle, the girl with no privilege. And Anna Marie's like, like, I don't want to be part of like your system of lies. So now since Crystal said that you've been proven to be a liar, now Anna Marie has worked it around that now Crystal has a system of lies. She just waited a segment further uh, to do it to her. And Crystal goes, you're not a part of it. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Crystal shutting it down. Go, Anna Marie, you don't have to be a, you're not a part of my system of lies at all. And Andy goes more than the shallow fake socialite allegations. Dorit, you seem particularly, particularly offended about the slight on your education. Why? And Dorit goes, oh, I think I'm the only one here with a college degree. And Crystal is like, what? And Erica points to Anna Marie goes, she knows. And Garcelle laughs. Anna Marie laughs. And he goes, uh, sorry, sorry. No, I'm not talking about. And Andy's like, one, two, three. I mean, you got three people here. And Crystal's like, I'm going to stand by the uneducated comment based on you calling me a child bride, Dorit. That is a disgusting thing to say. This Dorit, man, it's like, did you go to college? Like, what are you doing? And it's like, there is this element of like me, 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 where you literally thought you might be the only person that went to college, even though we're having actually discussions about what the fuck Anna Marie does for a living and like, you know, her education. It is, I mean, oh God. Anyways. Dorit comes back under this child bride comment with, you know, they called Priscilla Presley a child bride. Kind of like, huh, she's a pretty big deal. She was married to Elvis. Not too bad. Huh? Beep, boop, 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 boop. Like, you know, like, yeah. no, I meant it as a compliment. Ooh, good for you, Crystal. And Crystal's like, I'm an Asian person, Dorit. And Garcelle's like, it's not, it's the Asian. See, that's what I'm talking about, Dorit. And Crystal's like, as an Asian person, child bride is equivalent to a male order bride. Do you know that? Like, I even fucking knew that. And Dreet's like, no, I do. And obviously it was a, a throwaway comment in my confessional that was not what I was insinuating. It was off the back of you calling us unintelligent, which is, by the way, the reason why she is calling you unintelligent, because you say shit like that. Child bride? My God. That's what I'm saying. And she does it behind their backs and thinks she's getting off a of funny when it's just kind of like tasteless and like, Ugh, child like oh priscilla presley over there um it is wild and kyle's like but the other part of it saying you were like 12 i'm always saying someone's young like they're like 12 that's like the number people say seem to say like kyle what are you saying there and chris was like you said i got married at 12 i got married at 24 dorit i had already gone to college and i built a company worth over a hundred million dollars right now and dorit's like wow I am Beverly Beach. <laughs> oh, have you been to Buga de Beppo? Oh, Dorit's room. I have businesses worth over $10,000. So take that, child bride. 
Anyways, Chris was like, so for you to say that you were in a college and getting all of this education, building businesses while I'm getting married at 12 years old is bullshit. It's a microaggressive comment. And this is what cracks me up of like to read in past seasons, like I'm a child of the world, but you don't seem to have your eyes open to the actual world that you are a child of. Like It's like, it is wild for even this to be a discussion and you're still falling into these little traps. And Dreet's like, not traps, that's the wrong word. Dreet's like, well, that was not my intention. And so- Lesson learned, and I appreciate it. Lesson learned. Do you really believe? Like, how many times we heard Dorit say "lesson learned"? Anyways, Erica is like, it feels macro, not micro. No, it would be micro, not macro. Erica. Anyways, Andy's like, okay, Crystal, you found your voice this year. You use it loudly. What message do you hope that we heard the loudest? And Crystal smiles. I'm here, and I'm actually loving it. So that's it. So Crystal did a really good job at this reunion. She was clear, held strong. You know, I thought she did great. And he's like, okay, we're going to take a break. And then we come back and we're like, well, she's the Beverly Hills OG, but the Kyle Richards who showed up this year was almost unrecognizable. New tattoos, a new fitness regime, regime, no booze and no more people pleasing. But how did this new Kyle fit in with her old friends? Let's take a look. And we have her little clip package and we have Mauricio in their home. And Kyle's like, I'm at a point in my life. I don't have to explain to anybody to anything to anybody anymore, anymore, including you. And Mauricio's like, what are you talking about, love bean? And then Eric in Vegas going, I walk out here and who is in her full gym look with her Birkin? Does this Birkin need to work out, Kyle? And then Mauricio in a scene going, uh, how many tattoos do you have right now, love bean? And she's like, five. Well, five tattoos is a lot. And then Sutton is like, well, what? Are you preparing for prison? There's a lot of tattoos. Are you doing a Jen Shaw thing, I say, I say? And then in Vegas, Kyle going, can I have a non-alcoholic beer? And Garcelle's like, how long is this going to go on? And Erica's like, I asked the same fucking thing. Kyle in a ta- talking head going, everyone wants me to drop a split and do the helicopter with my ponytail. I mean, I'm fun no matter what, okay? I fucking scissor sober now. No, and then we have Anna Marie's birthday party. And Kyle's like, would you ever date a woman? And Chris is like, would you? And Kyle's like, uh, yeah. In the car, Kyle's like, people are like, I don't understand this friendship. Talking about Morgan. And Dreet's like, I mean, you are kind of morphing into one another. And they show photos of Morgan and Kyle dressed up as Garth and Wayne from Wayne's World. You know, the hats, all that, uh, the, the ripped jeans. And Dreet's like, you put the first letter of your name on her body. And they show Kyle at the tattoo parlor tatting Morgan with a fancy K. Put it on me, Kyle. I love when you tattoo me with a K. Maybe next year we'll get a Y and then an L and then an E. And then maybe we'll do a property up. And that spells property of Kyle. Anyways, Kyle's therapist is like, what are you currently dealing with that is triggering you? And Kyle in tears is like, you know, her best friend, Lorene, took her life on May 1st. And this was her other half. I, you know, we had a Lorene Celebration of Life event where Kyle's like, I hope everyone remembers Lorene as a beautiful, energetic, positive, funny, smart, and loving, devoted mom, wife, daughter, sister, and a friend that she was. Kyle in a talking head's like, since Lorene died, I don't want to have a wasted day of not feeling good or spending time with people I don't want to spend my time with. I think that's a beautiful thing to think, you know, and I, I'm a people pleaser myself and I think it is interesting and I do support that part of Kyle. I just wish it wasn't on a reality show so she could even feel freer to do this. It's like, yeah, spend the, your life the way you want to spend it. Most people never have the the courage or the means to actually live for themselves and to say, I don't want to spend a moment feeling bad because this life is so damn hard. I do still think it was a little funny that we had the celebration of life event and it was really beautiful and Kyle made a speech and then Morgan Wade sang a song that was like, I want to put you on the floor, lay you down and strip you down and do things to your body. That was weird. Anyways, Andy's like, all right. A big motivation for the changes in your life, Kyle, was revealing what we, what when we learned that your best friend since the age of seven, Lorene, had tragically died by suicide. Where are you in the grieving process? And Kyle's like, well, I think there's days I've learned in therapy. Um, I think I'm doing a disassociation thing. Or if you know it's something too painful, I try not to think about it at all. Other days, I can barely move from the sofa, so it just depends. Yeah, I mean that's that's that makes a lot of sense. That's it. Yeah, I think we all have gone through that or will go through that. 
And Andy's like, at the celebration of life, I know you welcome the support of the ladies, but at other points of the season, there was a marked dis- distance between you and your friends, especially Dorit. It seemed like maybe that began last year when we were all together. You said that you were disappointed in Dorit for how she handled the Kathy situation at the reunion. Dorit, had you suspected this or is that a shock? And Dorit's like, that this I really wanted to get into because um, I really want to understand. I can say this was absolute assurance. There's nothing I ever wanted more than for you and Kathy to be okay, period. I have a relationship with Kathy, which was independent of my relationship with you. I didn't want to get in the middle. And Kyle interrupts, but you don't. You didn't know her that well. Kyle? I mean, it's not like you. I have never spent time with Kathy with you up until she filmed at the show. And Kyle's like, right. I'm saying at an event or a party. My point is we were closer and the conversations that we were having led me to believe that you know that what? That you seem to be very disappointed in her behavior. Only when you would tell me stories I never knew about from the past. Oh, obviously I felt bad. There were stories that I don't want to bring up here. And Kyle smirks. So this is another kind of example of Kyle, you know, editing her own storyline of like telling Dorit information and expecting Dorit not to share because it is off camera. So there is a lot of pain in Kyle's life that we don't know the first thing about. And Dorit does know these stories and is expected to keep her mouth shut. And that's why even with those text messages at the beginning of this episode, Kyle feels like that was a major betrayal that they were shared. Kyle's like, no, it was the stuff that happened about Aspen and everything too. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. And Dorit's like, no, I do. I want to. Absolutely. And Kyle angrily is like, no, I'm not going to get into that because of you, because of my family and my sister. Dorit has just taken it right and left from people today. Do we think Dorit's going to come back next season? Like, I mean, really, I was, I mean... <laughs> really? It's weird. Erica's just looking off in the distance like, make me a bird so I can fly far, far, far away. Mikey, come get me. Kyle's like, it feels like to me in that moment, like at the reunion last year, that people didn't know they were really coming after me and they were like, rah, rah to Kathy. And it just seemed like when you said, I think Kathy just wants some support. Flashback to the reunion last year where Dorit's like, she wants you to accept a little bit of responsibility in this, Kyle. And Kyle's like, I don't want you to interject in this right now. No problem. <laughs> Kyle goes, to me, it feels like you wanted to be on the side of whatever the audience thinks and agrees with. It seems like I've noticed it a number of times. I find it troubling and sad for these ladies that they refer to the audience so much of like Dorit's trying to, you know, get in good with the audience. You know, Kyle obviously plays very close attention to what we all say and post. And I, I hope she can get away from that as well, because obviously it's not healthy. I mean, it's sick for us even too, right? Anyways, Dorit's like, I don't even follow what the audience, I, huh, I'm in my bubble, <laughs> child ride. Kyle interrupts. It's like, she just wants to be on the side of the audience. That to me feels like you care more about the audience. Like, ah, uh, and Dorit's like, that is the most hysterical thing I've ever heard. Uh, you know, Dorit hangs around PK mainly, so who knows what her sense of humor is. But anyways, um, yeah, it's hard. Like Kyle is that person that, Kyle's ultimately wrong in a lot of this just because she is so closed off on a reality show about her actual life. Um, but, you know, Kyle also is like, screw you, Dorit. You're under me. You're under me. There's no way you're going to win this argument. Anyways, next week, the reunion continues. And Sutton's like, I didn't like the stimulate the simulation of Cunnilingus. And Erica's like, but do you like it in real life? I'm just kidding. Do you like kind of like it? And Dorit's like, I've had an incredibly difficult last two months. And then he covers his mouth to yawn. And Dorit's like, don't you dare. And then Garcelle in a scene is like, well, I thought it was strange that a robber would leave your phone by the gate, Dorit, because you asked him to. And Dorit's like, it's just not that crazy. Okay. But what is crazy is to actually go on national television and peddle a false narrative. And then he's like, can you better explain to me why you sat down with the victims, Erica? And Erica's like, I cannot. And Sutton's like, Zleeks. Kyle seems shocked. I love that Erica did me with the victims. And now she's like, I don't fucking know. I, I don't fucking know why I did that. Sudden in the scene's like, well, you have been relentlessly mean to me. And Kyle's like, you act like I did something wrong to you. Instead of saying, are you okay? Do you need a friend? And Kyle then yelling, my family's falling apart. Don't talk about me sharing what's going on in my life. And Sudden's like, have you lost your mind? I won't need Avi to knock you out. But man, Kyle, like, this is like, don't talk to me about sharing what's going on in my life. That's the big thing, though, is that she didn't. And it, it, it breaks your heart because you do know she's going through so much. Anyway, Sutton's like, oh, you want to talk about my horse now, Kyle? And Kyle's like, oh, we're not allowed to talk about the horse either. Name him. Name him. Name him. No, and Kyle's like, I did not say anything. The things I could have and I did not. So how about that? And Erica smirks. Um, 
Erica seems to really still have a thing against Sutton. Um, I don't know. You know, it, it'll be interesting as Erica uh, and Kyle, the new Erica and Rinna. I mean, it'll be interesting if Kyle does come back. That's why I think there's an opportunity for Freddie Mellencamp to potentially go back, even though I don't think that is very entertaining at all. I could see to make Kyle comfortable because I think they're going to want to follow her journey, whatever it is. Um, so this is just the first part. We'll see what the other two get into. Now, I want to talk about a couple of things surrounding Real Housewives of Beverly Hills right now, uh, even though this has been a super long show so far. But uh well, anyways, well, listen, you guys know, if you listen to the show, one of my radio heroes has been Howard Stern forever. Well, what's interesting is he has been a Housewives fan for a very long time. I love when Howard will occasionally talk about Housewives, but he did talk about Housewives the other day on Tuesday's episode of the Howard Stern show on Sirius XM. And I wanted to uh, play you this. This is from an account by Wig Hello Drama that I really enjoy. And this is Howard Stern talking about watching the finale of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Big Beverly Hills housewife fan. I watched that show religiously. One of the gals on there, Kyle, she's getting, uh, it looks like her marriage is on the rocks. She calls a meeting with her children and discusses it with them on camera. And I'm like, that's the craziest shit I ever saw. The husband's sitting there. Even I mean, I don't know. He's got to go Was along he blindsided? With it, Did he know that she hey, he seems that? He seems in on it, but the family is so hell bent on being famous. They bring the kids, to, to, young kids, on camera, and they. I mean, I love it. Don't get me wrong. Kids are crying. <laughs> like literally, like I'm a divorced guy. I can't imagine dragging. But telling your kids is the most horrible thing you can do to them. And, the, and you got to wait for the cameras to be set up before you yeah. can do it. <laughs> and the husband, he said, he got a glass of wine. He goes, excuse me, he's, he's pouring a glass of wine, this guy, because <laughs> he's slugging it down during it. I'm watching this thing. So that was Howard Stern talking about it. And that's such a great point. It's, you know, about the kids, you know, like the, the, the how dark is that? Now, I don't think obviously this was the first time, you know, that the kids were hearing this for the first time. You know, but obviously to do this conversation with the kids at any point, even if after they've had the first conversation away from the cameras is dark and you got to like understand that. But I love Howard saying what we all say, though, is like, I fucking love it, but it's crazy. It's truly crazy. Like, that's crazy to think about. So I wanted to play you that. Also, Kyle, in regards to that uh, Dorit text message from Kyle that she shared, this is a quote from Kyle. She says, um, I did not know at the time that she read my text message and that was private. And I was really shocked by that. She's someone who I care about and her family. It's going to take me a minute to forgive her. So that was Kyle in regards to that text message. So this poor Dorit, she can't get anything right. But more importantly, what did you guys think? How did you leave off with all of this? And uh, are you excited about the next two episodes? Um, I'm really excited to see what information we get out about Morgan, more stuff about Mauricio, but it is like pulling teeth out of Kyle to get the actual honest truth about something. And I just don't think she's comfortable with that. So I'm curious where we go because we have two more episodes left. So thank you for joining me here today. And then now there will be a part two where I will talk about all the Vanderpump drama. You damn, damn Vanderpump idiot gang kids. Uh, shake my fist to the sky like an angry old man because today is the one year anniversary of Scandal. But I appreciate you guys being here and uh, I'll talk to you very soon.